Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, for everyone out there listening, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Professor Elizabeth Weiss. I'm a physical anthropologist at San Jose State University. Um, I do studies of skeletal remains. And in the last couple of years, since my most recent book, Repatriation and Erasing the Past, has come out, um, there has been quite a controversy about... um, my position, um, which is that I'm not for the reburial of bones. Um, and um, this has erupted into basically um, a cancel culture attack. Um, I think I've mentioned your story on a past episode and just said how the experience is. It's not fair. I think we talked a little bit off air about it as well, too. It's just it's not. Um, it's just when you when it comes to research and it comes to something like this, it's already a sensitive subject because you're dealing with remains. But especially if it's um, in your case, it's remains from like eight, 1800s, right? It's not anything of recent. It's not anything recent. The um, the most recent that I have studied here at San Jose State are actually mm-hmm. like they stop like around um, probably around 300 years ago, but they go back to uh, several thousand, like 2,500 or to 3,000 years ago. So it's all pre-contact. What's the claims that people are putting you as? Like a lot of people, I mean, people say things all the time. People, I get, I get labeled a racist if I don't have a person that's not white every five episodes. And it's like, I don't look at that, but if that's what people want to pick out of it, that's what they'll do. Um, people label people a lot of things. I'm just curious to what are their attacks being focused on? Um, I know you said something about a picture before um, in an episode I was listening to you with past guest, Michael Shermer. Um, it can't just be because of that. There has to be other things as well too, or is it just because of that? Well, basically um, what, how this, you know, over the years, I've written a lot about um, reburial laws in, in, the Amer- in North America um, and other places too, but focused on the US. And my position is that you cannot really link ancient um, remains with modern tribes. It's one thing if the time period is very short, but if you're looking at thousands of years ago, it's really a false link. And so one of the things that I've argued is that the repatriation and reburial laws in the US are written like religious laws, basically saying that if there's a creation myth or if tribal religious leaders claim that there's a link that this should be taken seriously and the bones should be reburied. And my position is that that's unscientific and that although people can have religious beliefs, it should not intrude on scientific research and it's a specific religious belief uh, above and beyond all others should not be supported by the government. So for example, um, the Native Americans Grave Protection and Repatriation Act requires the committee to have two traditional Indian religious leaders on the committee. Why would, why traditional Indian religious leaders? So basically, it's it's not even good enough if you had a Native American who was a Christian. or a Mormon or, you know, a non-traditional Indian religion, which we don't even know what that really means. Um, So my position is that these laws are poorly written, that they interfere with science and that reburial should not arise. There's many anthropologists who have brought up very similar issues. 
But there's also the pro repatriation argument that that um, and these um, arguments usually fall upon kind of a we want to decolonize the science argument. It's a postmodern argument of it's more important who tells the story than if the story is is correct. And we want to, um, you know, right the wrongs of the past. And in my opinion, if you're going to make decisions on uh, what on the importance of uh, collections, whether they get preserved or reburied, these should be made on uh, accurate decisions, correct assumptions, not religious assumptions that may not, may not hold to scrutiny of science. So I think there's a huge hypocrisy in this as well, because many of my colleagues who are, are for repatriation would never support any would never support a Christian creationist's argument. Um, and yet when it's an indigenous creationist argument, they have no problem accepting it. And I don't see the difference between the two. So this then um, in 2020, um, I wrote a book, uh, I, my, uh, I had a book published, excuse me, um, with a co-author, James W. Springer, who is a retired attorney and, a, and an anthropologist. Um, and, you know, we basically unpack this repatriation ideo ideology that's a postmodern ideology of if, it, if the story is being told by a chosen tribal spokesperson, it's right. And if it's told by somebody else, it's not right. And so social political identity is more important than accuracy. Um, and we also look at the problems of the establishment of a religion in NACRA of, you know, focusing on the importance of tribal, traditional tribal religions as evidence. This book was published by University Press. Um, it was peer reviewed. Um, and when it came out in 2020, um, basically there was an attack on the book um, that was uh, an attempt to get the book banned. Now they'll never say, oh, we wanted to ba ban the book. They say, oh, well, we wanted to, you know, we think that it shouldn't be widely available for free, right? <laughs> so um, they're against having the book open access, for example, so that you could get it in the library. They don't want libraries to carry it. And you have to right? basically, when you put a fee on it, people are going to be deterred from reading it because it's not a free um, exactly. source. And, um, and books like ours are expensive um, because it's an academic press. And so one of the things is that, you know, this attempt to restrict readership is a sense, is a form of censorship. So um, these uh, activists, against um, the, my anti-repatriation perspective, um, you know, started a campaign against the book, got an open letter, um, basically um, set upon the uh, publishers, publishers issued an apology. Um, and um, since then, there's been a, coming and going of waves of how vicious the attack has been. Um, when I published an op-ed in the Mercury News, which is the Bay Area's biggest newspaper, um, against the new Cal NAGPRA laws, um, the attacks increased. Interestingly, I also um, posted a picture of me with a skull, with a skull um, and I said, you know, I was so happy to be back, um, back with old friends. And um, this in, increased the attack against me. And people act like it's just about the photo, but it's not. It's a continuation of this disagreement between reburial and preservation, yeah. between um, basically uh, a religious perspective and a scientific perspective. 
had I not posted the photo, it's not like there would have been no attack. <laughs> there had already been. Um, but the other thing is that these photo, photos like this, um, six months prior, were um, people at my university had no problem with it. Um, I, was, I had been asked multiple times to uh, pose with skeletal remains by, un by the university, um, the various university individuals, university administrators and so forth. Um, look at the Smithsonian website and you'll see lots of anthropologists with bones. Um, so I think that it's not about the picture. I think it's about the fact that I pointed out that repatriation is an anti-science, postmodern religious movement. And unlike those people who wanted to censor my book, um, I actually have no problem with people who write some completely different perspectives than me. I would never sign a letter about that I want a book not open access. Uh, I think that people should read as widely as they want and, and uh, make up their own mind. And I would hope that one of the books that they choose to read is, is um, Repatriation and Erasing the Past. So that's a big part of it. The other part of it is, of course, my university's um, reactions to this. Um, although on the surface, they can claim that there was no retaliation against me. Um, there, when I tried to get a speaker series for, for academic uh, freedom and, and in anthropology and um, archaeology, uh, new rules were thrown up against, up against me that we had never used before for inviting speakers. Um, they literally locked, you know, changed the lock of the curation facility, even though at the time when they did this, there were remains that were not Native American in the curation facility. Um, and now they have a set of new protocols. Um, if anyone's um, working with the skeletal remains, like inventorying the Native American skeletal remains, they have um, a new set of protocols that are practically uh, medieval, including um, that menstruating women are not allowed to handle remains, that there will be no swearing in the curation facility um, and um, that appropriate attire is required. What is appropriate attire? You know, I can guarantee you one thing that's very subjective and if they don't like you, they will decide your attire is not appropriate. So I think that these kind of things um, snowball and also, um, the goalposts continue to move. So, you know, when NAGPRA and reburial uh, laws were passed, anthropologists, many anthropologists were like, well, you know what, it will be okay because only the affiliated remains will be returned. And we're supportive of that. Only remains with a real link will be, will be returned and reburied and we'll still have collections to further the science. And then, that got eroded away because it, the determination of what is affiliated got weakened. Then the next part is, well, um, you know, even though the remains may be buried, we'll still have access to skeletal remains in the meantime to do studies before the repair. Now that is gone in many places. So even if the remains are literally in the curation facility, you are not allowed to do research on them. Um, and then um, they say, well, you know, at least we'll have the things like photographs and x-rays to, to consider. I've been requesting x-rays for these, um, for the skeletal remains in the curation facility for months. And I just found out yesterday that their plan is to return this to give the skull, the x-rays to the tribes and the tribes plan to burn these x-rays. I mean, this is data destruction and it's anti-scientific and they would have, 
they would probably not have even known that they were x-rays um, of the remains had I not requested for them. And therefore, I think it's also retaliatory. Um, so I think that, you know, there's so many, so many wrinkles in this. A large part of it is about the repatriation issue. But the other part of the issue, I think, is about understanding that um, there's a difference between you know, social, political identity and choosing to listen to someone because of their identity, whether that be race um, or um, their politics um, and treating each individual as an individual. And so one of the other th things that arose um, early on in this whole controversy is that there was a um, webinar on how to create a successful Native American studies program at, a, at our university. And I attended this webinar and I was shocked because the speakers that they had gotten, um, professors at other universities who were advising the San Jose State on what they should do, basically were saying that only Native Americans should be working at the center. And one of the, their big concerns was with Hispanics working at the center. Because if you had a Hispanic secretary and she was mistaken for Native American, that would be an insult to Native Americans. And if you had a Hispanic secretary and she mistook a Native American for a Hispanic, that would be an insult to Native Americans. And my question is, why is that insulting? If somebody you know, asks me, oh, you know, are you Irish? And I have no Irish in my family. I don't find it insulting. I think, well, you know, I would only find it insulting if I didn't like the Irish, right? So I think that, you know, um, this kind of the most important thing about a person is their race or ethnicity. It's just a wrong way of looking at things. Um, another wrinkle in this was, um, was, the site black authors, so one of our um, faculty members sent out to the list, uh, email list um, that contains like alum and, um, and graduate students and so forth and, and faculty that we should use the site black authors when we're looking at research, which is a database um, that has only black authors. <laughs> um, and I sent the email you know, I responded and I basically said, um, you know, I think that although this is well-intentioned, um, that I encourage people to cite the best work out there regardless of the author's race. Sex, you know, uh, doesn't matter. You know, it's sexual orientation. <laughs> if it's the best piece out there, that's what should be looked at. And so this was considered racist that I pointed out that Race doesn't matter when you're looking at the data. I think that this is a re real big problem in academia and in general right now is that, you know, that there's this overemphasis in um, what I call social or political identity. Um, and, um, you know, one of the other aspects is that when this was all occurring, my dean uh, hosted my chair at a, um, at a national conference basically saying, um, and the title of that con the, of the session was what to do when your tenured colleague is branded a racist. And basically their solution was, you know, what you do is you, you know, try to keep resources away from them and um, try to get them out of the classroom if you can. What you the know? hell? That's like, you could tell they're scared is the thing. It's like trying to keep resources away so they don't burn those too or they don't take those away because it was attached to the person that's being blamed for the things. Yeah. I'm going to try and work back um, through everything that you said. Um, the main thing about institutions locking the door so you can't access them. That really has to suck because you think that an institution that'll be more than happy to brand their name all over your face and everything when you're doing something good 
but then they shut you off when something when something like this happens, not even something bad, just something like this happens, maybe a mistake, whatever you want to call it. They're more than happy to push you out to the wolves and you feel like you're all alone. What I think is like a main thing of why I never trusted the education system for a host of reasons, but I still give them a shot is because I don't think I, I think it's inherently a good idea. I think education systems from when I was a kid have gotten way, way better. I just think there needs to be a different understanding when it comes to just trying to uh, excel the human species compared to what people want to, I get it, cultural identity. I understand that's important, but it's gone to the extreme. People go to Ancestry.com and they feel like just because they're 5%, I'm 23% Ashkenazi. You don't see me walk around letting everybody know like, hey, get, did, I'm not shoving it in anybody's face. But it, the issue starts to become is where like I, I've always had this joke of like, if you can get a person who studies indigenous studies and a person who's an anthropologist in the same room, it's like, it's damn near impossible because in a sense it is because they're dealing with two different perspectives. But I feel like in education or in anything, there needs to be an open platform of discussion. You shouldn't be criticized. You shouldn't be labeled something. You should be either, even if it's not even like, I don't consider what you did an extreme situation, but to them, obviously it is. So I'm trying to understand from their perspective as well. It's just a talk have a conversation. Did you mean this when you did that? Did you mean this when you did that? No, I didn't. I had no idea. I'm so sorry about that. But you're going to start limiting history. And what happens is it doesn't just, we might know what the real history is, but what about future generations? We can't tell them important things. We can't think to remember every single thing. My grandpa didn't walk me through every single day of his life. I have no clue. So when he's not here, what am I going to do? I don't I only remember what he decided he wanted to tell me, which happened to be the same Vietnam story over and over again. Um, but you're missing, you're going to end up missing crucial data. For instance, George Washington's teeth being made of cherry wood, but then you find out they're made of slave teeth that riled a bunch of people up and got a bunch of people upset. You need to know your real history. You need to understand what it is. And you need to understand that we don't think this way anymore. Society is progressing, especially with technology and social media in such a fast pace right now that it literally seems like things I said three years ago, probably don't translate well today. Um, it, it, it that's just how it how it goes. I just don't expect people to want to hold you accountable for things that you say in the past, but they want to cancel culture being huge. And sadly, now it's leaked into academia, where you're having researchers that are scared to even get research because they're afraid to dive into this subject in case something like this happens. I, I'm pretty sure throughout your whole education point until that happened, you did not think this was ever going to happen. You didn't even think that any of this type of stuff would even like be a possibility but it occurred because people are looking to just find somebody and string them up on a cross yeah it's kind of interesting um when i first started at um i because of my background i i probably was aware that things like this would happen um part of it is you know i i was married to phil rushton so yeah i have that um that experience of you know knowing what he went through not that I was married to him when he, much of that happened but still knowing what what um, can happen but the other thing is when I and um, one of my early books um, was also about uh, NAGPRA and my one of my earliest articles was an anti-reburial article it's Kennewick Man's funeral and so my perspective on reburial has stayed the same, um, has um, evolved to be more um, detailed and understanding why it's problematic, but I haven't changed my mind on it. In the past, my university had no problem with that with this, they disagree, you know, my colleagues disagreed with me or some of my colleagues disagreed with me, but the fact was that it was a civil disagreement um, that was, you know, they were like, yeah, we don't agree with her, but um, we're glad to have her in the department and basically argue, you know, that this was actually good that there was um, diversity of thought in the department and so forth. Um, so I was, I felt very supported um, for a long time. I never hid my perspective. 
And I, and I felt that the department and the university um, and the college supported me. Um, I don't feel that way now. Um, I do think that they've um, taken a different direction in the way they treat uh, um, people that disagree with them, um, the main message. Um, I also, it's also interesting when I first started writing about repatriation, you know, some people would find my email and I'd get a lot of hate email. Um, and some was threatening and so forth. And this was like way back in 2008. And, um, and I thought, you know, that it's interesting that, you know, I had that experience and so forth, but it was very much um, directed at me and not at trying to get others to jump on the bandwagon to get at me, which is quite different. And so now I, I very rarely get emails that are hate emails. I get a lot of supportive emails. I, I literally get emails that are supportive every, you know, every day, some during some periods, right? So literally, it's not a week that goes by that I don't get supportive emails. Um, but the thing is that now what they do instead is instead of just sending me a nasty email, they put it on social media and they start a campaign against you. So it's a much more um, concerted effort um, to, in, to cancel or deplatform someone, as opposed to in the past, it, I think it was less, less of a concerted effort and more of an individual thing of somebody you know, reaching out to you and saying, you know, I can't stand you, you know, you're a ghoul or uh, things like that. Most of the attacks on me um, have been ad hominem attacks, basically, in even now, basically, you know, um, ranging from, you know, that calling me a ghoul to um, calling me a bitch, to call me a racist, of course, a white supremacist, um, to, you know, uh, attacks on my physical appearance. Um, you know, my hair is too dry or I look like uh, William Defoe or whatever you want to say. But these are personal attacks, ad hominem attacks that don't, um, that I think show that they don't have a strong argument. If they did, they wouldn't need to say these things. Um, I, I think it's immature um, to call out people um, in this way. Um, when I gave a presentation at the Society for American Archaeology, which was deplatformed, um, basically the talk was um, about creationism. And it are, I asked the question of why um, we accept indigenous creationism in archaeology, whereas we would not accept any other form of creationism. Um, and um, basically the there was a uh, effort to get my talk pulled. It was not effective because it was literally, they just didn't have the time, I think. Um, it was pre-recorded, but then played. Um, and then during the first playing of it, you were there to answer questions. And, um, but after that, they did, the talk was supposed to stay on the uh, society's a conference website for three months and they pulled it and issued an apology. Um, and, you know, there was all these attacks on, um, on my, you know, as me as a person, as opposed to my argument. I think this is another part of that, you know, it's the, it's the identity of the person and not the argument problem. But the other thing about it was, um, you know, people were like, um, when the talk was being played that first time and the comment section was filling up with just insults, someone wrote um, something along the lines of, um, where is she? She's supposed to be here to answer any questions. And I typed in, I'm here. If there's a legitimate question, I'm happy to answer it. So, but I'm not going to, you know, 
engage in back and forth name calling. I think this is ridiculous. It It's sad. Only, I, I mean, I can understand the perspective of why people would be upset, but I think that it's a little bit misunderstood in a sense. It seems like they have an idea in their head and they're going to attack you for it. And I don't think their anger is being the place just for you. I think like the only reason that they're pointing out appearance stuff or they're trying to take down your image in a sense is because that's all they have. There's no factual evidence that a logical public would look at and be like, no, that doesn't make sense. But sadly, it's a fear thing too. Institutions don't want to deal with it. People don't want to deal with it. Other people won't get up and support only because in an aspect, they don't want to be tied in with it. It's like an Alex Jones type situation. It's not as bad as Alex Jones's whole thing, but it's the whole thing. Nobody wants to hear him talk. Everyone has labeled him as such. The media has labeled him as such. Everything has labeled him as such. That's why um, when I was looking through theories um, online for potential guests, uh, like when I had Peter Ward on and everything. Uh, because he made some Medea hypothesis. There's people that get labeled on there that get tied in with conspiracy stuff. And that conspiracy stuff gets tied into white nationalists and all this. It's like, are these really true though? Like before you used to be able to understand that person has a swastika on his head. That person's probably what they, what it says they are. But now it's like, you have to really kind of verify where I just tell people out there. Now you need to talk to these people yourself. You need to have a discussion with these people. You need to look at the whole issue and try and see every side of it because you have to decipher information out for yourself. And hopefully we're going to get to a point where that happens, but sadly, I don't know how many careers are going to be ruined because of it. I mean, education is probably, and I would, if you would ask me 10, 15 years ago, I would have said, you can throw it down the, the drain. I don't think you need it, but I went to school for psychology. I, I learned to understand people and give people time. I learned to be open-minded. I was never really given any time. So I thought I might as well give time to other people. And you start to realize like, as bad as you think this person is, or what you've heard about this person is never true. And people, they, but people will just run and they don't even want to associate with you or talk to you about it because they like what they're doing. They're getting an army of people that support them. Now, are you so willing to let, like, when's it going to get to a point where society says something that's ridiculous, where, oh, you know, like the idea that like pedophilia is okay, or it's a mental health thing in a sense, sure. But are saying it's okay. is not true. Like saying that's okay, or you can do anything like that, or or give it a pass, or this person is whatever. You can't like people. Society pushed back on that. I think that's a waking up for a lot of people. Was like, hey, make sure that when things are being said, you're not just nodding your head in fear that you're gonna have an army of people at your door. You need to take a stand in your moral convictions of the thing that you believe in, and don't try and attack anybody for theirs. Like it's very, very hard. You're not going to eliminate every single racist person out there. It's just not going to happen. And there are true racists out there. But when you start labeling everything as such, when it's not, you start destroying the word. Now the word doesn't hold power like it used to. It's like fact checker. When people say fact checker, I'm like, who's, who's who, who, scroll to the bottom of a page or whatever that says fact checker and see if there's an advertisement for Biden or Trump, you'll know who they're supporting. You know, it's, it, it becomes an issue where there's a lot of people out there like myself looking to just know what answers are and looking to, and even like yourself looking to try and advance the human species, trying to find evidence about where we came from or what the logical basis or whatever evidence you can find when you're doing one of your uh, digs or you're looking through remains. Um, but to deter you from doing something that you're passionate about, I mean, you didn't get in the field for money. You got in it because you loved what you do and your people aren't going to listen to you because of a whole entire situation where you got labeled as such is wrong. I expect people to want to, you know, they'll toilet Google the hell out of something, but when they want to do the right things, they never look into it a hundred percent. They just read the headline and run off. And I think that's an issue with media. I think I'm really ashamed at your, or mad at your institution, for instance, for not backing you more or being there in support. I think that's, I've seen that with a lot of academics. Um, but it's this, this woke society that we're in. And I mean, woke in, in its regular terms isn't necessarily bad. It's a, it's a good advance, but the way that people are acting about it is not good at all. This idea that you have to ban people and shut them down, like cancel culture. I think Bill Burr has a joke about it. If a comedian cracks a joke and you want to cancel them, all you're doing is you're making them angry because now they can't support their family and they go home and read a whole nother generation of why they should hate this certain thing. And that's exactly how it goes. I've talked to, I've talked 
to female stand-up comedians who say comedy should never punch down, which no comedy people will laugh if they don't laugh and the comedian has to move on and pick a different routine or different joke but i've talked to people with indigenous studies these conversations have never gone well i um you mentioned a while ago i wanted to track back to was a, a publication that you had written um there was a book i've rec- i've said in a podcast with an indigenous studies person called empire of the summer moon as soon as i said the words as soon as they left my lips she goes that's the most racist book ever i can't believe you said that you must be a racist and i'm like there's 10,000 reviews on it with five stars and jordan peterson is one of those people and i know jordan peterson he's not a racist so i start getting down i don't know him like personally but yeah. i know him through like see, i've watched him for a long time people don't care they want to find something and they don't like the narrative that it is and instead of putting the book down and walking away and doing something else just like you said be more than happy to write a book about a perspective that isn't yours or write another rivaling thing to it it doesn't matter but saying that you can't let people access the thing that you have and if you do you have to do some shady thing like make the book 90 dollars. soon as i heard you say that in that podcast my heart dropped I was like, no, I like, I'm a five, five bucks is too much for me. Like anything that's, that's clothes, that's food, that's anything. Um, inflation sucks by the way. Um, but it, that's another thing of like gatekeeping in my sense. It, it, It really is. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to any academic who's just looking to excel in the field that they're in and try and make a name for themselves. And it's not fair to students. One of the things is that with, um, my own, um, you know, way of teaching is that I always try to um, present multiple perspectives. Um, I don't hide my perspective because I think that's silly. I think that if I try to, you know, go into the classroom and say, oh yeah, I'm I'm on the fence with this. They know that I'm not. Um, But I don't, when I talk about repatriation, I say, you know, here's my perspective and I give them my stuff to read and I talk about my perspective. I say, and here's somebody else's perspective. And I don't look for the worst, what I would think is, oh, that's the worst argument. I actually look for what I think is the most reasonable argument, the best written one, because I don't, I'm not trying to create this kind of um, straw man thing of, you know, oh, I can, uh, you know, um, win this argument by having the worst pro repatriation book um, next to my book. I try to give them the best examples and I want them to make their up their own mind. I also, um, one of the things that I always do in my classes, have always done even from the get go, is I don't grade people on their opinion. I mean, I know that some professors, if you don't agree with them, they will give you a lower grade. I'm, I've never done that. Um, there's so many other ways to ensure that you, the students are learning and that, you know, for me, for example, and I teach physical anthropology classes, uh, you know, question, whether or not you agree with me on the repatriation issue, I can still test them on 206 bones in the human body, right? And so I just think like, this is what education is about is about, you know, introducing different perspectives. Um, I would be surprised if any of the people who signed the open letter against my book would, um, would assign my book to read to their class um, and to assign it without snarky comments, you know, um, let the students read it and make up their own minds. If I have the better argument for them, for their perspective, that's, you know, that should be up to the reader, not to a um, committee who decides what you should or should not be allowed to read. Um, Open access, um, I mean, library, you know, library access basically is what open access is. Um, This is essential for students. This is, I think that, you know, we don't necessarily buy all the books we read. That's, that's why the library system is so great. I love um, Thomas Sowell's um, uh, recounts of when he first went to the library and how this opened a whole world for him. And, you know, um, I've always loved libraries from that perspective that 
you know, this is a, a resource that, you know, what a brilliant resource to have a way to get all the different ideas from different people over the years without cost. You know, of course, there's the, the taxpayer's cost, but this is a tax I'm more than happy to pay as long as it remains, um, you know, a, a source that is not politicized and takes out books like mine because they don't fit a particular narrative. I always said that online censorship, the difference, like the internet was sales pitched as a library, but at no point the library would ever stop you from picking out a book. And now we've gotten to that point where books aren't even being admitted just because people don't want them in there. Um, I think that's wrong because that's going to mess up. Like, I'm just worried about the future to be hundred percent honest with you. What record are they going to have or what history are they going to remember? You don't cherry pick history. History was always written by the winner. But I feel like in these times and ages, you need to have a sense of like, we need to have an overall discussion. You know, back in Roman archaeology, for instance, there was just a higher wealth class that knew how to read and write. So you have stories that people are realizing it was just from a certain perspective. And then you lost the other perspective of it. Let's not have that happen here. Like people say, well, the Internet's there. The Internet, it'll it'll be, you know, it'll be there. Yeah. But what happens if like a solar flare or something happens? I have no clue. We hear about those things all the time. The Internet is more sensitive than we probably think. And it gets stuff gets deleted all the time off of it without you ever being able to find it again. I don't know how many times I've recommended like a video and then I can't find the video. And I'm like, where'd it go? I think like, you realize probably take it off or something like that. Yeah. It's fragile as much as history is. And you can't sit there and try and pick through the remains like a vulture and expect to be like, oh, this is the pieces I want. No, you have to include it all because information is valuable. And it helps teach you not to repeat the same mistakes in a sense. And I, I with, for instance, for in your case, what do you, what do you, are you able to manage? Are you able to recover anything of with this? Or you just have to wait for time to heal. I understand. Cause like it happened in 2020, but COVID kind of like put everything like dimmed down. And I guess that picture was like, everyone was probably just looking for something to just hit at you. So, yeah. So, um, I mean, Prior to COVID, I was literally, you know, doing curational work that involved sorting skeletal remains. And I was, I had students helping with that, um, volunteer students, just so that, you know, giving them the chance to learn those things. Then COVID struck. And um, of course, you know, that basically um, put everything on hold. When we came back and, you know, uh, the first thing I did was I went into the curation facility to start to restart the curation process that I had had been interrupted. And one of the uh, criticisms about uh, against me, excuse me, one of the criticisms against me is that, you know, the laws say that you should minimize handling of the skeletal remains and that here I am handling a bone for no apparent reason. Well, the reason was that I was in there curating the remains, putting things back. And I had to take that skull out of the box to put something else in it. And, um, and so I took a quick snapshot. Um, and I think that if anyone takes a sincere look at that photo, they'll see that that is a genuinely happy photo, that that smile is genuine because I was so happy to be back there. It's not, you know, this wasn't a, you know, oh, you know, I'm gonna go into the curation facility and, you know, just for the heck of it, take out skulls and take photos. I was working. And then I thought, wow, this is so great. I wanna share this joy. Um, in the past, we had been encouraged to do that, to promote anthropology. Um, I think the other thing is um, that I had hoped, I knew that repatriation and reburial of these remains were likely in this short period of time. I had hoped that I would be uh, given the opportunity to finish A, the curation um, activities that I was undertaking, which uh, ironically were to help uh, the collection be as, as well suited when they're repatriated as possible so that, you know, there's uh, that each burial is as complete as possible. 
Um, so, so that's one of the aspects. The other aspect is that, um, is the other aspect is that I had several um, research projects planned that I was hoping to get done. Those will likely never be done. Um, one was regarding um, uh, health indicators such as anemia, so iron deficiency, and whether when we see these health indicators of iron deficiency, whether they might be something else. There's a big debate in the field about whether iron deficiency uh, indicators really are indicators of, um, of other things like vitamin C deficiency, or some of these might not even be pathological disease related, but rather how the body grows. So I, was, I had a whole research plan for that. And then I also had a research plan um, to look at um, bone loss versus bone gain. Um, there's a kind of concept that um, there are individuals who are more likely to build bone. So like if you work out and you put strain on your bone that builds bone, but some people it builds more bone than others, right? Um, these people tend to also have less osteoporosis, but then there are some diseases that cause bone building like osteoarthritis. And so one of my, uh, I had done an earlier study on this issue. That was a small study that I had hoped to expand on. And um, this was one of my pro one of my next research studies. And um, this could, this not only would tell about the people of the past, but is an interesting bone biology question. Um, some of my research has been published in medical journals because it's not only about reconstructing the past, it's about understanding bone biology as well. So I think that, um, that those things, they're likely gone. Those opportunities are likely gone. Um, there is a smaller, um, less well-preserved collection that's not Native American that they wanted, um, that they, I finally got access to as, after over a month of trying to get access to it. Um, it's still not in an ideal situ position, but um, one of the reasons why they didn't give me access to it right away was basically they wanted to put new protocols in place to control my research, including one of the things that I fiercely fought against was um, restrictions on photographs. Not only restrictions on photographs of, um, of Native American remains, but of remains from Carthage that have nothing to do with the Cal Nagpra or Nagpra. And, um, you know, my chair literally said to me, um, you know, I want to give you access to this, but we got to have new protocols in place. And then, you know, as, you know, I was fighting against this, um, you know, it, it basically all, you know, crumbled and, and they had to end up giving me access. But it, it uh, took over a month, over a month to resolve. This is a type of retaliation to keep me away from skeletal collections because they don't like my perspective on repatriation. Um, to then try to um, put in new protocols on something that has nothing to do with that. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll probably be able to um, do a study or two on that collection. Um, it's not very well preserved, um, but um, you know, the month and a half that I lost for it is not gonna come back. Um, the x-rays, um, if they are destroyed, those are gone for good. Um, and one of the things that people don't understand about, and I, you know, many people, lay pe people um, don't understand is they are, you know, why don't you just study the remains then give them back? And that's not how science works. Science is a cumulative process. You study the collections over and over. You ask multiple questions. Some questions may not have even arisen when the remains were discovered. And so a preservation of the collection is key to understanding you know, past, those past peoples, um, but also um, bone biology, 
comparative studies with human evolution. So one of the, one of the um, research things I've done in the past was to use the skeletal sample as a comparative um, stat, uh, as a comparative set for like human evolution studies. Um, forensic, all of these require continual preservation of the data and of the skeletal remains. And this will be lost. And what you'll have is, um, is you'll have a really the ruin of anthropology as a science, physical anthropology as a science. And I think the other thing that you lose is you lose the kind of wonder that students have when they actually come into contact with real remains. Um, I'm teaching bioarchaeology right now. Bioarchaeology is a study of skeletal remains in the archaeological record. And basically, you know, I, you know, create little activities for the class where we get hands on um, experience with these, um, with the teaching collection. And um, there is no greater joy than seeing the students say, wow, that's amazing when they look at something like a um, huge muscle marker or, you know, a, um, a uh, shiny, a shiny joint from arthritis. They've seen the pictures in the book. It's not the same. It's not the same of having it in your hand and understanding, you know, I mean, like I talk about stress fractures of the lower back and I can talk about it till I'm blue in my face, but you show them a photo and it's like, oh, that's interesting. You show them the bone and they say, that's amazing. You're gonna lose that when you start taking bones away. And right now they're just taking the research collections away, but they, I have no doubt that the next step will be the teaching collection. There's already emails um, like from, in UCLA about, you know, check your teaching collections to see if there's anything that needs to be um, taken out of there. I have no doubt that this is where it's going to go. Um, and this will be the end of the joy of anthropology and our understanding of a bone biology and um, the and past populations. Are you thinking about starting any communities or any um, organizations or anything of scientists or academics who do want to take a stand in a lot of the issues that academia is facing? Like I hear open science, but honestly, the term science or the hijacking of the term just doesn't mean the same. And I think a general public probably feels the same about that as well, too. I have a lot of academics who rather talk about something else when they come on the show rather than what they're working on, only because they just it's very, very hard to get motivated um, in academia in general, just because you have a lot of roadblocks and not just archaeology that comes with anything or not archaeology, anthropology. It comes with any science out there. There's so many things where people just go man, you can do that, but it's honestly a safer bet to do this. And they toss out another idea. I'm like, but why would you not want to do the thing you want to research? You're going to do choose your third option. And it's yeah. like, well, it's just not, it's not a safe bet. And sadly, institutions are more than happy. I think Eric Weinstein has a, uh, he has a story about this, about one of his friends, I guess they got the institution told him that he had to move to continue his research, but really was trying to deter him from the actual research he was diving into, like making him uproot his whole family to be able to do so. And I was like, I thought this was all like China stuff. Like China doesn't want you going to this. No, but in a sense that might be true as well too, but I feel like it's these institutions that are just afraid to go against what society standards are. And I honestly look at like, Whenever you write a textbook or whenever you're, you're doing whatever you're teaching, you're educating the audience, do you, should you base it on what they think now or should you be basing it off of just making sure that people are prepared for the future? And there's a lot of people out there probably listening to this episode, future academics or just pe maybe someone comes across this who's just looking, maybe they come across you, you're famous in the future. You know what I mean? Like super famous, like yeah. Bugattis and everything. Um, but they come across this episode, they want to hear your experience and everything. It might deter them. I mean, there's little kids out there that are hoping one day they can be 
be able to dig up fossils or be able to look at bones or do anything like that. And it's going to deter them from entering the field. See, the world was run by a diploma, and I didn't think that was right for a very long time. But now devaluing it to zero or saying it's there's no point in even doing it, that is a big, big, big issue. I never wanted that. I just didn't think that was the only gateway to being successful. But now yeah. you're taking that away and saying, oh, we just don't want to have it at all. Why yeah. would you do that? And, you know, I think it's quite interesting. Um, I think that there are a lot of people who are not anthropologists, not archaeologists, who love the field, who love reading the popular science books on it, who love, uh, you know, who, who volunteer sometimes at excavations and um, and these people shouldn't be forgotten either, you know, like historical societies, that they are, they are members of the community that, you know, have an interest in the past. And you don't have to have a academic degree um, to have this interest and to engage in this kind of um, activity. Um, I think that, you know, I don't, I think that um, what you sometimes get is academics going to, to a question or so that is easier to answer or easier to collect the data. And I understand that sometimes. Um, but I think that if it's based on their decision, it's one thing. If it's based on the fact that they are ha having to get approval by literally religious group like in our case with NAGPRA um, where some questions you will be allowed to ask and other questions you won't be I think that that's problematic I've never regretted studying skeletal remains I've never even regretted studying the skeletal remains of um, native you know past Native Americans I love anthropology and archaeology and one of the things that um, people accuse me of incorrectly is saying that I have no respect for these collections or the, for the remains. I have a tremendous amount of respect for them. I always had throughout my whole career have tried my very best to make sure that the remains were well preserved, for example, having reboxed um, the whole collection uh, on my own, um, making sure that when students learn how to hold a skull that they don't stick the finger, their fingers in the eye sockets because that the bones, the lacrimal bones um, in the eye are so delicate that they're like paper thin. I have a tremendous respect for the knowledge that can be gained from the study of these skeletal remains. And I have a tremendous amount of respect for past peoples. One of my favorite things to do is when I find a interesting skeleton, is to try to figure out what this past person's life was like, not what somebody now says, oh, I, you know, our oral myths say that this was, it, this was uh, a person who was a shaman or so, but literally looking at it and saying, you know, oh, this, he had this fracture or that disease, or how did that impact them? Or, you know, I noticed that um, he has a lot of arthritis on the jawbone and a tooth wear pattern that suggests that he was using his teeth as tools, maybe uh, as an artisan, or, you know, like literally trying to figure out what went on in their lives. And I think that this is an interesting question, but I also think that it's a um, question that you would only be interested in if you have respect for the past people. So I think that some of these um, issues of terms like respect, uh, you know, we talked about earlier appropriate attire, um, these are kind of, you know, so subjective. If they disagree with you, they'll say, well, you don't have respect. If they disagree with you, you're not wearing the right thing. If they disagree with you, you're a racist. And it has nothing to do with the actual amount of respect or um, you know, decorum that you are engaging in. It has to do with that they disagree with you and they will, instead of you know, having a debate about it, 
um, and instead of having a debate about the the actual topic, um, they just you know refer you know go to name calling and um, trying to get you out of the collection. Um, I don't know you know how this will end up in the sense um, in the other fields. Um, I think that anthropology and archaeology is um, is in real danger, um, but um, I don't think that it will end there. I think that it's you know it is just uh, very obvious in our field because of a because of the laws, the repatriation laws. Um, B because um, you know anthropology is interesting um, in archaeology. So I always tell this to my students. My sister studied literature, and uh, um, when we would go out um, and you know we talk to people, and they'd be like, "Oh, what do you do?" It's like I'm a literature professor. We're like, "Oh, okay, okay," and it's like I'm I'm an anthropology professor. Really? What do you do? Right? And then when I talk about, "Oh, I study skeletal remains of the past populations," then they're like, "This is really interesting stuff to lots of people," and. And, and so I've never felt like I would want to stray from this, my research. I find it fascinating. And I find that um, I'm not alone with this fascination. So if it comes to the point where you, you can't do the research, I think that then this is the death of anthropology and archeology. span uh, It doesn't change. It just, they may still use that name, but it's not, it's not the same field anymore. Just give it some time because you're going to see a pushback against this cancel culture thing so fast. It's just going to drop off. There's a lot of people who just feel like they've been cooped up for too long and they're looking for something they can, they can go after. It's just you can't let it get to you. And I'm sure at this point you've learned that you just just don't even feed into it. People are going to say a bunch of things. I mean, everyone says something about somebody. You can get criticisms on a podcast episode. You can get criticisms <laughs> on whatever. Um it's funny you said the William Defoe thing because I always get mistaken for Tom Holland every single freaking time. <laughs> I, I don't know. That was just that was. Uh, I'm actually curious. I want to talk to your sister because a literature professor and people walk by her. I would be like, "Hey, explain the Dewey <laughs> Decimal System. Like, why is that a thing? Like, you'd have so many questions right there." Um, but yeah, um, and but you also asked about um, an you know starting organizations. I, you know, I'm a member of the National Association of Scholars that, you know, is very active in fighting against, uh, pushback against some of these um, cancel culture attacks. Um, they, um, the president is Peter Wood, who is an anthropologist, and they hosted recently a podcast with um, myself and Bruce Baroque, who's an uh, archaeologist on the repatriation debate. I reached out to so many people asking them if they would come join us. And it, it was impossible to get some another anthropologist either pro or against repatriation. And people are scared. And you know, I have, um, I know colleagues who completely agree with me and who say, I can't come out and say it because I'm scared. I have, um, I know of an archaeologist um, who gets death threats um, for his um, questioning of certain retellings of, of sites. Um, I, you know, when this first arose, when the, when the open letter against my book first arose, um, I was contacted by several state archaeologists who said, you know, I'm, I completely agree with your perspective. I, I've read your works. I completely agree, but I don't want to lose my job or, but I'm scared to say anything. Please don't use my name if you, you know, mention this. So I do think people are scared. Um, and this is a very telling, uh, very telling um, environment we live in. When one of the um, when the site black authors list uh, email event you know email uh, thing when 
on where um, I responded about, you know, using the best resources as opposed to, um, as opposed to, who, you know, the color of the researcher's skin as the um, determination what of who you will cite. Um, I got an email from a former student of mine who's still at, um, working at the university. And she, you know, she, it was sent from her private email and she emailed me and said, you know, I've basically been thinking about this all night, all day and all night, didn't sleep basically. And it, I wanted to let you know that I don't think you're a racist but I didn't want to do it on my university email account. She was scared to write it from her, from the university email account. So she used her, G, you know, her Yahoo or Gmail or whatever else it was. Um, and I think this is, this is the most detrimental aspect of cancel culture is the breeding of fear. You know, you can disagree with somebody, but, you know, people should not be scared that if they then come on inside on the wrong side, that they're too, they too will be canceled. Yeah, it's uh, the fear mongering. I don't, I, people are just feeding off of it at this point now. And honestly, it, it's going to cause some long term damage for a lot of people as well, too. Not maybe us per se, but future generations of people that are just going to be living in fear in a lot of aspects. And I don't want that out of anything. Um, I, I guarantee you, you're going to see a light at the end of the tunnel, especially in your experience as well, too. It's not going to be like this forever. Um, but for cancel culture in general, there's going to be an end to it. It's, it's going, people are going to wake up to what's really important. That's going to be the people around them. I feel like the fighting is just because it's so easily accessible through Twitter and all the means of social media. But even now I'm seeing things where people like I was in a Twitter space. It was supposed to be about black pride and it immediately turned into kill whitey. They switched the name and everything. I think Eric Weinstein screenshotted it too and put it on there because he was in the group. He's how I found it. And I was just like, what just happened so quick? I didn't even notice the narrative change. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it's not about uh, racism in a sense. It's just a group of people that want to spin the narrative they want to spin. They want to get people riled up in a sense. And it sucks that it's happening to you. It sucks it's happening to other academics out there. But hopefully, I mean, we get enough people or an organization or something started, multiple organizations. Hopefully, the institutions will stick by their guns and realize the people that they should be protecting are the people who are working for them, not the people that are just tossing out names at them. Yeah, I, I honestly think that things will change as well. Uh, I don't know um, how much damage will be left. Um, and I'm not sure that every field will survive, um, but I don't think that this is going to continue on forever. Um, and um, I think that uh, one of the things that does uh, give me uh, great hope is um, just my experience with students and how, how genuinely uh, interested they are in the subject um, of anthropology and archaeology. And I would hope that, you know, when they graduate and they think back about, you know, what was the best experience if that they include in there? Oh, those lab sessions we had with Professor Weiss. Um, I think that that's, that those kind of, ex those kinds of memories and experiences um, may make a difference, may in the end make people say, you know what, we, we don't want um, to have other people determine what we read, what we can see, what can be studied. Um, you know, there's a movement for digital databases from the indigenous, indigenous knowledge digital databases. And um, one of the things that, how these databases differ from other databases is that, um, they want to put restrictions on who can access the, them. And one of the things that they want to restrict, of course, is, you know, males and females should have different knowledge sets, which I think is absurd. But um, the other thing is, literally, um, for some of the databases, you have to fill out a form. And you have to think these are like, you know, uh, databases that contain things like uh, information about cultural knowledge. 
you have to fill out a form um, of what question you want to ask and and why you're doing you know what you're interested in and so forth and and of course you know your name and your gender and your you know whatever else and a committee of eight in one of these data databases a committee of eight will sit down look at your proposal and decide whether you're allowed to read what's in that in the database or not this is a form of censorship um when i was um when i was the acting collections curator for all of the skeletal collections at San Jose State, including the Native American collections. I tried to ensure that these collections were as utilized as possible um, by, and many times by young researchers, by people with, um, who are doing their master's degree in archeology span or their PhD in archeology. span um, And the only thing I asked for the, for to, um, determine whether they should get access or not is a date, a, a, a timeline, right? Dates um, to see whether somebody else is accessing them. Um, and a short proposal, not because I was determining whether their hypothesis, like a two page proposal, not whether I was determining their hypothesis was something I think you should test or not, but rather, you know, if they would were looking at, um, if they were interested in looking at uh, individuals in their 70s and 80s, and we don't have any, I would want, I wouldn't want to waste their time, right? So, um, and um, I thought that this was a really important part of my career um, to enable access, but I also enabled access to the skeletal remains to other professors who had lost access because of repatriation and reburial laws. So I think that, um, you know, access to whether it's to books, to uh, data like uh, digital data or to skeletal remains, um, this is one of the great aspects of science and then one of the great equalizers to get knowledge out there. And it shouldn't be for me or anyone else to determine what question is okay to ask and what is not okay to ask. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, is there anything you want to say to anybody out there who, like I said before, is might be coming across this episode because you're famous of the future, but just anybody that's looking for maybe a little bit of motivation to s stay working in the field or be willing to, I wouldn't say challenge, but just be willing to just, research what they want to research, no matter if it conflicts with a certain narrative or something that's being spun out there. Because if it pulls off to be a great success, they're not going to criticize you at all for it. Like I said, they'll stamp their name and brand all over you. If it's something that agrees in the public, or it's something that's popular and gets you a million dollars. But as soon as you go against something where you get one person with a blow horn just screaming at you, um, they'll go against you in an instant. And I feel like there's a lot of people out there right now that would like to know where to go. And I want to know what you would give advice to them now. Well, I would say one thing is that um, to reject basically calls for um, or, or claims that science is Western and colonialist um, and to remember that science and the study of the past is for everyone. And that if you are interested in the study of the past, if you're interested in anthropology or archeology, span don't necessarily let today's politics deter you from that. Um, there are still people who are uh, genuinely interested in helping uh, you know, future anthropologists continue to um, search for the best way to understand humans and the past populations. And that's really what we're about. And that's not a Western idea. And it's not to help Westerners, it's to help everybody. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, science, you know, some people don't like the word truth anymore. <laughs> um, I think that science is a search for truth. 
you might not get there, but that's, you know, we want to tell the best accurate depiction of what occurred and what will happen if we're do making predictions. And that too is a universal um, quality. Um, and I think that the final thing is that, you know, um, freedom of uh, academic freedom and freedom of speech, I think are too important to just walk away from. Um, there's, you know, there's questions about, you know, uh, you know, should certain speech be silenced? Um, you know, we had obviously, you know, you have the traditional, you know, crying fire in a crowded room thing. Um, but when you start saying that speech should be silenced because it, it might cause uh, emotional harm, what kind of, you know, who determines that emotional harm? And um, what kind of emotional harm are they talking about? Because there's real harm as well in silencing people. And there's real harm in, as well in not letting um, science progress. You never know what the next big discovery will be. And you never know what field will make that discovery. I appreciate you for doing the podcast, Elizabeth, and I'm going to make sure I link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. I'd love to have you back on again whenever we get some time. Hopefully the university doesn't pay more construction workers to throw um, stuff out around outside. But thanks again for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.